everybody. It is John from Watson Baptist Church, and I really miss my church family, and I really miss being with my friends, and I really miss going to restaurants, and I really miss a lot of stuff, and this is my therapy, so it is time for Fun with Crafts, and today we're going to be having fun with stained glass. Now, stained glass is one of my favorite, absolute favorite kinds of art. And when most people think of stained glass, they think of churches, and, and that's true. Churches have been using stained glass for 2,000 years. In fact, here at Watson Baptist, we have some stained glass art in our baptistry. Uh, you can travel to Europe, especially in the Middle Ages, and you can see some gorgeous, gorgeous works of art in their cathedrals and churches there, hundreds of years old. Although stained glass actually is much older than that, uh, history shows us that the Romans and even the ancient Egyptians used colored glass to create some of their artwork. It's fascinating. You can create stained glass by actually adding various metallic salts and substances to glass while it's being produced. You can add a little gold here and some iron oxide or some chromium or nickel and hey, even a little uranium and you can get blue and red and green or violet or really bright yellow. And then you have to carefully cut the glass and you shape it and you fit it into these strips of lead or other metal and then you solder it in and you make a pattern, a piece of art. Now, all that said, I I'm not gonna do any of that today. I'm not gonna be making my own colored glass from scratch. In fact, I didn't even buy any stained glass to cut because my wife reminded me I'm not allowed to use sharp objects. I don't have a glass cutter and I don't have any lead strips or a soldering iron. So what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna cheat a lot because I got this really cool paint called gallery glass and this stuff is amazing it can be used on glass or windows or mirrors or plexiglass and you you paint it on and it dries and it looks just like stained glass and then I've got these adhesive strips called lead lines and they're super bendy and then all I needed was this $10 frame and glass from Walmart and I'm good to go I'm ready to make some stained glass art. So check this out. something interesting I purchased a pack of these little lead lines these adhesive strips and each packet comes with seven feet of strips and I thought that would be more than enough for me turns out I'm, I'm running pretty low so I went to Amazon to try and order more and they would only let me order one pack at a time I couldn't order two because according to Amazon they said this would be hoarding material because apparently during a national pandemic, fake stained glass art supplies are in huge demand. So they have to ration out these precious, precious strips. Let's keep going. So I think we're just about done adding the adhesive leads. Look, I'm a lighthouse. And I think it looks really cool even just as a clear piece of stained glass and I could just do the connective points and be done with it. But we're going to add some color and keep going with this and it's going to really pop I think when it's done.
Took a while, but I finished my very own stained glass lighthouse, and I know that it's fake stained glass, but unless you look really, really close, you can't tell. I'll be honest, I enjoyed this medium so much. I even made a stained glass tiger for my mom, and then I made another lighthouse right here because I really like lighthouses. And what's cool is you can take like your phone and imagine the sun coming up. Look at that, how cool that'll be. And it looks like the light's coming from the lighthouse itself. We're gonna do it right here, the sun coming up. Isn't that neat? It's really, really cool. Now you might be asking the question, you know, John, why, why do the lighthouse? Well, I made a lighthouse because this is sort of our motto here for us at Watson Baptist Church. During my very first sermon here as pastor, I shared the story about the origins of why there are so many lighthouses along the eastern seaboard. Once there was a lighthouse that stood out on a rocky coastline, and it was built up because this coastline was so dangerous, and numerous ships would crash into the rocks each year, and so the people in that small community built a lighthouse. At first, it was just a little hut with a beacon, and they had a couple of fishing boats, and they had some brave volunteers that any time there was a ship that looked like it was in distress, they would charge out into the dark waters and look to save lives. And eventually, more and more people wanted to be a part of that. People joined with them, and they all learned how to become rescue workers so they could all go boldly out into the dark waters and rescue people in peril. And over time, as the number of people grew, their resources also grew, and they worked on improvements. They worked on that lighthouse. They built it up. They fixed it up. They made it bigger. They made it taller. They made it more impressive. And they also made it nicer on the inside. They added a big room for their meetings, a fancy dining hall, a full kitchen. And then over time, the vision of the people there began to shift and that lighthouse really became more of a clubhouse. The members started to think that going out into the water was risky work. It was arduous and they could hire professional lifesavers to go out into that water instead. That way they could stay safe inside and focus on their club events. Then they decided one night that the interior of the lighthouse was so nice now, they, they really didn't want to bring in those grimy and wet shipwreck victims inside of their building, so they installed showers on the outside because those people really needed to get cleaned up before they could be allowed in. And then finally, at one meeting, someone said, listen, we really need to get out of the life-saving business. We have a very nice and comfortable place here, and we all know each other, and we all follow the rules, and bringing in outsiders only messes things up. And the majority of people agreed with this proposal. Now, a handful of members rejected it. They said, life-saving is the whole reason we're here. This is our mission. Everything that we do in this place ought to have something to do with the mission of saving lives. But that small group was outvoted, and so they left, and that group moved a few miles down the beach, and they built their own new small lighthouse, a new little life-saving station. And then a few years later, the exact same thing happened again. Their group grew, and lots of people joined, and they fixed up their lighthouse, and it got messy and dirty as shipwreck victims were brought in, so they turned that lighthouse into a members club only too. And this same pattern repeated and repeated and repeated for generations. You had these startup lighthouses, and they started very strong in their mission to save lives, but eventually they lost focus on the outside world, and they turned into clubhouses. And this is why you can travel the northeastern seaboard today and find a large number of exclusive clubhouses on the shoreline. And sadly... This is the same pattern that has happened in so many churches. When too many members of a church develop a club set, clubhouse mindset over that of a life-saving station. And when the church loses sight of its mission to seek and to save the lost. Jesus said to us, he said, we are the light of the world. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. He made it very clear that his mission is now our mission. 
guess the question is, do you want to be a lighthouse or a clubhouse? Hey, thank you so much for watching. And I'm going to go and make more fake stained glass. <laughs>